Welcome, Dr. Stain, to our SSAT Mentor of the Month series for February 2021. Um, most of you know Dr. Stain as he was a past president at SSAT and is uh, the current chair of the Board of Trustees. Dr. Stain was the chairman of surgery at Albany Medical Center for over 15 years until he recently moved on to become chair at Leahy Clinic. Dr. Stain is a true mentor to me in that he hired me for my first surgical job and has been fundamental in my early career. Uh, so Dr. Stan, I'm truly honored to be able to uh, do this interview. Uh, when at his um, address uh, before leaving Albany Med, Dr. Stan presented a very thoughtful, uh, thought-provoking uh, lecture on diversity, inclusion, and equity in surgery that particularly now is very timely. So um, uh, this is the, the topic for the discussion. Um, so, Dr. Steen, uh, why does surgery, diversity in surgery matter? Well, um, ultimately, I think it matters to uh, give patients the best care. Um, although there's relatively scant literature that um, a diverse surgeon is going to have a better outcome with an underrepresented minority patient, I think there is some data that uh, suggests that um, communication is likely better with patients. Uh, I think patients may be more likely to go see the doctor. But ultimately, you know, we talk about equity. Um, I, I think that there are tremendous uh, surgeons of all race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation. And I think the we should have an equal chance to have those people be part of our ranks. Uh, in your grand rounds, you discussed the curb cut effect. Uh, it was an interesting phenomenon that I actually had never even thought about. Can you speak more about this phenomenon and how it applies to diversity in uh, in our field? Well, you know, I was, you know, I, I've given the, this this talk a, talk a talk on diversity for you know a couple years, and I've. I change it every time. I learn new things. I was talking to my wife about how um, uh, 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 diversity in general and how it may help everyone. And she said, oh, you mean the curb cut effect? And the curb cut effect, which was uh, I had never heard of. And I, I, you know, so I Googled it and I found this article written by a woman, uh, Angela Blackwell in Stanford Innovation in, in 2017 which describes in this article and others, the history of the curb cut effect. And, and you know, I'm from California, I'd never heard about it. It, it, it. The concept started in Berkeley when some disabled um, men in wheelchairs decided to pour some concrete at the end of the curb so they create a ramp so they could get off the edge of a curb. And, and the concept of the curb cut effect is that some things that we do as a society, which may help the more vulnerable, less abled, or diverse population, often have the effect of helping everybody. The, the example they talked to in this um, article is about how, you know, I mean, I, in, I was growing up in California in the 70s, and, um, you know, and I remember before there was those ramps and you come off a curb. And, and now you think about nothing if you're on a skateboard or a bike or you're pulling your luggage, you always just pull it across that thing they have to get your, the wheels off. And that's an example of something that was originally just, you know, uh, uh, this instituted to help disabled people helps everybody. I think you could say the same thing about um, some, some diversity efforts. Um, I think that, uh, if we make it easier for women who, I'll, 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 I guess, show my, my, my how old fashioned I am, who bear the, the, the most of the burden of childcare, <laughs> um, if we make it good for them to be able to have maternity leave. And I was talking to a friend of mine from college uh, whose son is a high powered attorney somewhere uh, in California. And he was telling me his son is taking two months of paternity leave. So, so that's an example of something that was originally designed to help um, 
those who um, may have had less power helps everybody. And, and I think, you know, nowadays, most enlightened leaders would not think negatively, some still would, of a man who took paternity leave. Um, and I think, I think that's progress. Um, and, and it was especially uh, touching when I was talking to my friend about this because um, when he and I were going to college, we probably would have said, that'd be weird, you know, but we, we, we've raised kids who think it's normal. So, so there is progress. Absolutely. I remember taking six weeks of uh, paternity leave as a resident and uh, it was definitely not enough time uh, for your first child. Yeah. And definitely progress. Mm -hmm. Um, along those lines, what are some challenges? You've been an advocate for diversity and surgical leadership throughout your career. Uh, what are some challenges that you have faced and what are some things, what's, what direction do we need to head towards next? Well, I tell most people, yeah, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. You know, I mean, you, you, you will, I tell students, you will probably not be as lucky as me. Um, and I say that because, um, you know, and maybe it's just luck, you know, I, I or, you know, uh, Mike Stamos, who's the dean at, at UC Irvine, that's my alma mater, would, would probably not like me saying it's, it's not quite the Harvard of the, of the, of the, of the West. Um, so it was, a, you know, a, at the time I was there, it's gotten much better since I was there. It was a good medical school, but not UCSF or UCLA. It was, it was a good medical school. And I was able to match into a great residency for, for me, Los Angeles County USC Medical Center. Um, and, and the people I got exposed to were just incredible people. Um, they were movers and shakers in, in American surgery. Uh, Art Donovan, who was my uh, chair, and Tom Byrne, who was a vice chair, were both exceptional, you know, broadly trained general surgeons who could do everything, trauma, endocrine, thoracic, I mean, they were, you know, they were, so they were just really great, great role models. And then I had the opportunity based on their contacts um, to go to Switzerland and work with Les Blumgart, who at the time was one of the leading uh, liver surgeons in the world. Um, and, and then um, I came back, I worked at USC for a long time, 17 years counting residency. And then I had a chance uh, through another contact, Claude Oregon, who was um, on the board of Meharry Medical College, and he nominated me to be considered for that chair job uh, as chair of surgery at, at uh, Meharry Medical College. And then just just on a, on because I was lucky, you know, um, uh, my wife got hired for the Vanderbilt Cancer Center, and the head of the cancer center, a guy named Hal Moses, uh, who was one of I think Dan Beecham's mentors. He asked me if I could write a few pages for their uh, NCI designated cancer grant. So I wrote three pages about, you know, um, um, uh, patient accrual for clinical trials. I had some experience with Larry Leishman at USC. And, and then he said, well, could you write a little bit more? Um, and by the end of it, I had, um, before I left, become a co-principal investigator on the on the on the Harry side of the NCI funded U54 cancer grant. But probably more, more importantly, the experience I got of, of rubbing shoulder with some really, really spectacular scientists at, at Vanderbilt really helped me crystallize my ideas of what I wanted you know, to do. Um, and then when I came to uh, Albany, had a great dean. Um, who gave me the, 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 the freedom to uh, develop the Department of Surgery at a time that was available for clinical growth. And then I, I just went about trying to get the best people. So you were one of those people. Uh, I don't know if you remember, um, but I think you just kind of cold called me. <laughs> I did. You're <laughs> not the only one who's done that. I, I think that's the same way we got um, um, uh, what's her name? I have her face. I can't, I'll think of her name in a moment. Our melanoma surgeon. Um, Lindy Davis. Lindy Davis. Yeah. She cold called me. She, her husband was coming and she was coming and, and you know, and again, I, I think having an open mind and not being, um, 
so so narrow minded of what I'm looking for. Uh, and then I have some, you know, advantages because I'm a relatively prominent African American surgeon that, you know, we were able to become more diverse, I think both in gender uh, and race and ethnicity. But in some ways, it was not saying I'm going to go recruit, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for talent. And if talent comes my way, I'm, I'm smart enough to try and convince them this would be a good place to work. So, um, and then because of that, I've gotten involved in lots of national organizations, societies, and, and now I find myself as the old gray haired person that, that they ask for advice on things. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to point out incidentally that you uh, were a member of the Asian American uh, Society and uh, that, um, that uh, you have been diverse in, in so many different ways. Well, I think, I think it's a great meeting. It's a great organization. I have great friends in that. And, and I think that, um, again, it, it's sort of, you know, uh, I was talking to somebody last night, uh, I guess last night about that, that organization. And, you know, uh, the, the way surgery works, um, you know, there's an article written by uh, Claude Organ called The Interlocking of American Surgery, uh, written in the 80s when he was president of Southwestern Surgical Association, and it talks about how the connections people have throughout their career later in life will be things you can use before. I was talking to a resident today from Leahy. And, uh, you know, I was meeting the chief residents, you know, I, it, was, it was by Zoom. And, and, and I was asking her, you know, what are you going into? Where do you want to train? Where do you want to do your fellowship? And she mentioned uh, Cedar sinai and minimally invasive surgery. And there's a guy named Eddie, Ed Phillips. I don't know if you know who Ed Phillips is. Ed, Ed Phillips is one of the best surgeons I've ever seen. Um, he was an LA County graduate. And um, when, I did the first lap Coley at LA County and I did the first lap spleen at USC. He volunteered his time and he came over and took me through the cases. And, and it's those connections that, you know, and I, you know, I go to Pacific Coast Surgical, I see him and Nancy, his wife, it, it really is those connections that um, I'm able to send him an email and say, no, I'm not sure you're gonna take this resident, but I, I, I think you should look at her closely and maybe offer an interview. But, but those, you know, you know, I think, I think the society part of surgery is social. And um, I enjoy, you know, seeing my friends at meetings and those friends have helped me in, in many, many ways in, 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 in rising up in organizations. Thank you. Yeah, you've always been an advocate for medical students. Even now I send, so, you know, send medical students and residents your way. Um, uh, because I know that you will advocate for them. So there's just a little bit of Leahy trivia. So uh, I, I, there's a, a, re a resident named Helen Ho who finished here. She's an Albany Med student. And I was talking to the students, the, the residents today, about the conversation I had with Helen um, when she was an Albany Med student and trying to decide, you know, her fiance or boyfriend, somebody was at MIT and she wanted to go someplace else and should she favor family over, you know, and it was one of those things. And the, I think the, the residents here, you know, they appreciate the fact that I really got, and Sarah Cater is a PG one or two now. She's another Albany med student here. I haven't I seen her, her yet. Yeah, so I, th I think it's, it's funny because lots of the, uh, you know, as, as you're on the, the back nine of your career, uh, the things that you remember mostly are the people you've had a part in training. John Tarpey is one of the great program directors ever from Vanderbilt. Uh, we were talking about a resident, a Vanderbilt resident, and he says, you know, it's real easy to take it, take a credit for a little part of credit for the superstars that you had a little bit of, a little bit of contact with during the residency. And I think those are some of the, that's how I approach it. You know, I don't, I don't say I trained them, but I think I was able to give them some insight and, and advice along their path. And, you know, I, I just like when I see them, how well they're doing. Yeah, I think sometimes that little phone call or could, you know, be the make or break a moment in somebody's career. So, mm -hmm. and we all definitely appreciate that, that time mm -hmm. that, take, that people like you will take out to do that. <laughs> um, uh, 
with regards to that, um, during your talk, you talked, you mentioned a little bit about some of the barriers that we face in, in increasing diversity amongst our trainees and specifically in faculty members and, and within promoting our faculty members. What are some of the biggest challenges that our generation faces and what can we do to, to do a better job of making our, our, those bodies more diverse? Well, you first recognize there aren't many, there aren't enough diverse surgeons. So it's a small sample. Um, and you can impact that from the grassroots pipeline program where you, you know, you know, people go to more minorities or women go into good preschool, go to good high school, go to good college, go to good medical school. That's a long time to wait. <laughs> Um, I, I sort of think we should impact at the other end, and that is um, getting the very talented, diverse medical students to go into surgery. That's a small group of people. Then a small group of surgery residents uh, to go into academic surgery, because because you know I, I think the effects that you have, I have go beyond the patients we take care of, the effects you have by the residents who you train as program director and what they will do is, is like, a, you know, it's a multitude of times that you're gonna affect patient lives by the residents you train. And I think those advantages are much, much more in, um, in, uh, in academics. Nothing wrong with private practice, it's great. Um, one of my other mentors was a person named Anya Aquari, who was a USC, uh, I think he's USC class president, 1969 residency at uh, Mayo Clinic, full professor at Duke. Um, and I met him at the USC cocktail party uh, at the college. <laughs> never met him before. And, and he told me something that I'll never forget. Uh, as one of the few African-American surgeons who trained at LA County. I think I was number six in 50 years. Um, and it's, it's, it sounds harsh, but he said too much had been invested in me to go into private practice. You know, geez, I don't need all that pressure. Um, <laughs> Cause I was planning on going into private practice. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be fat and happy, you know? <laughs> and, and I think I took that as a challenge you know, at the time I didn't have, no one had offered me a job, so I didn't have a choice. Um, but I, I think, as I think about it, uh, and then Bob Higgins, who's the chair at Hopkins, I, African-American from Albany, uh, surgeon, uh, we wrote an editorial about um, perhaps that the way to increase diversity was to have more academic physicians, minority physicians as a way to be both role models for medical students but also to help educate their colleagues who are non-minority that it is possible to be diverse, to aspire for diversity in your department and still maintain excellence. So, so in answer your question, the answer I think is trying to attract the great um, diverse candidates are out there that your program, whether they're residents or faculty, is one that they will thrive in. Absolutely, thank you. Um, actually, I have one little comment because you you mentioned that. So we actually had, um, for some reason this year, we had an increase in the number of Muslim women that were the head scarf similar to me this year. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not like I selected those those residents yeah. out, but one of the residents commented to our faculty that, you know, they felt really refreshed to see that and they felt empowered to see that. So it, uh, I, um, you know, I, I, um, I, I just think that it's such an interesting phenomenon. So who knows? Well, that's well, I, I think, I guess I'll give you a challenge too. I mean, um, you, were not, you were not selected to be program director uh, at Albany because of your religion. You earned the job, you deserve the job. And I think that is a message to people, whether they're Muslim, Catholic, Jewish, that it's a relatively accepting environment. And I, and I think, you know, I mean, I, I'm not saying they're coming just because of that, but, but I think that um, 
you know, when you look at the website and they see me, um, I think we're more likely to get um, uh, African American Africans at least look at us. I still got to we still have to land them, but but I think you you, you will see that in, in having a woman program director, um, having a, a you know a program director with kids, having you know uh, you know an environment that people when they talk to residents they feel accepting. Much so, it's a, every it's a butterfly effect. Every you know, there's a there's always a consequence, and you know, with every action that happens. Um, uh, one last question for you. Um, so, uh, one of the it's a very interesting time that we we're living in. Uh, I think that the the impact of the coronavirus on minority patients has really opened all of our eyes to some of the inequalities that um, our patients experience. Um, how can we advocate for our patients um, who, uh, as surgeons, um, and what steps can we take to help make a change in the systems that we operate on, on a daily basis for, to advocate for patients of um, uh, minority backgrounds? I, I think, um, you know, it's gonna sound strange, but, but first do your day job very well, you know, I mean, your day job is being a surgeon and being a program director. I think being good at those jobs gives you credibility with the administration, with the, your chair, with nurses, with everybody. So um, I, th I, think it's, it, I think it's important to have a platform that people respect you. And when you speak up on an issue, which may be very personal to you about patients being mistreated in the hospital, not having access to vaccine, residents not getting treated. It's just so much more effective if you're speaking from a position that people, you know, know um, that you're you're very good at what you do. So so I, I think, you know, I think that, you know, um, you know, I, I do have a day job and I and I try to um, make sure I do that well so I can have the authority to advocate for other things. Well, thank you so much. That was very uh, helpful advice. Um, anything else that you had that, uh, regarding this topic to, uh, to add? I'm very proud of you and I'm gonna count you as one of those superstars that I had a small, small bit of helping. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Stein. It means so much for me to be able to do this and I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jessica. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.